Welcome to Send Me On My Way. I'm your host, Audrey Dean Kelly. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about everything from music to pop culture to reality TV to pretty much whatever I want. So let's get into it. Welcome back, y'all. Today, I wanted to talk about my creative process because it's taken me a long time to really understand what I have naturally just been doing over the years. Um, I I recently did like a consulting call with a guy about social media and creativity, and I um, was explaining to he he kind of asked me he was like, how do you carve out your process? And um, and he was a Virgo, and it just made me very acutely aware of like I'm an Aquarius, and the way I approach my process has always been more of the lack of a process. It's always been an instinctual feeling. And I definitely have had periods of being way more creative than others. Um, In fact, what inspired this episode was last night, I, I'm, as I mentioned in a previous episode, I'm doing this art show where it's basically a, a form of telephone where one artist passed their piece to the next one. So I got that, my piece last night. And as fate would have it, it hit me in one of the most creative states. Um, And when I'm in those states, I really try try to like maximize the capacity and just kind of let it flow. Um... And when I was younger, I didn't really understand what I was doing to get into those states. But as I've gotten older and I have found them more often, I think I understand what I'm doing. And I think the more that I learn about neuroscience, um, I'm a big fan of like Andrew Huberman and... um, Just understanding like dopamine and serotonin levels in your system and how that helps you operate in life. Um, but I think that one big aha moment for me a couple of years ago was, um, it was like a master class, I want to say, or a Ted talk that someone did. And I need to find the reference. I will find it. I'll link it. But, um, the woman was talking about boredom and how, when you leave that space, is when you find your most creative moments. And when I thought about it in regards to my own process, it just made so much sense why at some times I had been way more creative than other times and like how to tap into that. So for example, I, when I was younger, would often have songs come to me um, when I was doing the most mundane things, like laundry, when I was folding laundry, the chorus for Young, when I was in high school, anybody who remembers the Natalie's phase, the chorus for Young came to me when I was doing laundry at a laundromat in Eagle Rock. Um, And the way that I used to approach my music when I was younger was I wasn't someone who wrote things down right away. Um, I have a very auditory memory, um, and I figured that out in college. I, as an art history major, used to like write songs for my exams for like the dates and everything because I would be able to just remember a song after listening to it two or three times, especially if I wrote it. Um, And so that would help me remember things. So the way that I historically would approach songs would be that the first time I'd hear them, I wouldn't write them down. I almost would, would make it so that they would have to bother me to exist. And I know that sounds, I don't think that sounds crazy actually to anybody who writes music. I, I really don't, or maybe anybody who writes any anything creative. Um, and it was interesting, years ago, I had the opportunity to 
try out for Justin Timberlake's um, record label. He was not interested, which is fine. Uh, rejection is protection. But uh, I I didn't try out for him specifically. I tried out for the manager of his label in their offices in L.A. And uh, he, they were asking me after I performed, they were asking me about my songwriting process. And I was like, I, I kind of referenced this. I was like, I let songs bother me. And, and that's how I know that they're worthy of being made. Because in my mind, if I can't remember it, enough to write it down like if I can't remember the song enough for it to come back to me then it's not going to be catchy and nobody's going to remember it and so for a long time that's how I approached my songwriting um and I bring up the Justin Timberlake thing because I when I was in that that meeting I mentioned that and the manager was like, oh, that's really interesting because that apparently is how Justin approaches songwriting too. And also apparently that's how Michael Jackson approached songwriting. So um, I have always felt like when I'm in those kind of flow states that I'm really tapped into a higher consciousness. Now, I am not someone who is religious. I am spiritual. I am not religious, not an organized religious person. I respect whatever anybody wants to do, but I am more of the woo-woo spiritual side of things. Always have been. And so I do feel like I tap into this kind of, higher consciousness state when I'm writing. And there's a quote that I heard years ago that so perfectly explains how I feel when I write music. And I mentioned the religious thing earlier because this is a religious quote. Um, So it's just the sentiment of it is what I identify. Okay, so I am a hole in the flute that Christ's breath moves through. Listen to the music. So I've always felt like I am a vehicle when I'm in those states. And that almost like when I finish writing a song, it almost feels like a puzzle that came from somewhere else that I have been the vehicle to put together. And so that's always how I felt about my writing, um, the songs that I end up recording, end up remembering. Now, as I've gotten older, I have sort of changed my approach. Um, In general, I do still find most of my songs when I'm out on a walk, when I'm doing my dishes, when I leave space for that creativity and that flow state. And that TED Talk really helped me understand that like, that's why you're finding those ideas when you're out on a walk, when you're folding your laundry, when you are doing the dishes. So when you realize that that's how you create and that's the state, then you can start to leave space for that. And especially as a creator who's a parent of two, (laughs) um, I have to figure out my time for when I can leave space for that. Now, I am a co-parent. We have 50-50 custody. So naturally, I do have more time than a 100% um, a parent with a family together. So I use my time when I'm not with my kids to my maximum benefit. But when I do have them, I also allow myself to find these states. And it's oftentimes, you know, after they've gone to bed, when I go and I do the dishes and when I leave that space for 
something to come through. And so last night, I really tapped into a really great flow state. And it got me thinking about when I tend to like, because I write really well sometimes like right before I fall asleep. Like if I'm really, really, really tired, I have these like brilliant song ideas come through. And sometimes I totally forget those. And this goes back to like letting them come back to me. But I will say there have been times where I'm like, oh, I'm almost asleep. And I know that if I get up and I open my computer, you know, and I do keep a journal next to my bed. So sometimes I'll write stuff down. But when I'm in that really, really tired state, often, often when things come through. Also, sometimes if I wake up at like, like with Dean, I had like postpartum insomnia where I would wake up like every day at four o'clock in the morning to like six in the morning for like a year. Um, that time I also found to be super creative. I wrote Dear Life in that time of the morning. I finished like I kind of rewrote Smoking in the Sun in that time frame. I would find that there's like, and it's funny because I've heard this. I think I got this from Taryn Toomey is that this like 4 a.m. time is kind of like a magical, like creative flow time space. And so um, rather than fighting the really obnoxious insomnia, because like Dean started sleeping through the night at like, I don't know, eight weeks. Um, So for me to be up when my baby is like, sleeping was really frustrating. But again, I used that time to my benefit. I wrote a lot of songs from my last album in the wee hours of the morning and then recorded those songs in uh, the two hour Sunday, Saturday afternoon times that I had when my son was napping. Um, So I will say, Becoming a mom has made me surprisingly so much more efficient at being an artist. The absence of time makes it so that my output during those hours that are mine is like tenfold compared to the years that I had all the time in the world all the time in the world and just wasted it. I really did. I really did. (laughs) I, I mean, I didn't totally waste it, but like, I just didn't understand my creativity. I didn't understand the space for it. I was searching. I'm in a state now and it's interesting. So I I watched the Ali Wong uh, comedy special last night where she talks about like divorce mom energy. And I was just like, dying. It was like, girl, she's my spirit animal. But, um, I really realized that like, I'm in this state where like, I'm not chasing anything. I'm not trying to be someone so that someone marries me or I really have come into my, I think through the embarrassment and the shame of like going through a divorce, especially going through a divorce when you are pregnant. Um, and then finally like coming on here and like having a voice again, it's made it so that the amount of fucks that I give about other people's opinions of me are few and far between. (laughs) Like my, the circle that I care about what people think about me is like so small and it's really Dean and Stella, um, and my ex. Uh, but outside of that, my family, outside of that, I have come to a state of really knowing who I am, um, really knowing what I want and knowing how to create and flow. And it's taken me so long. It really, 
really has. So it's interesting because I think I gravitated towards things that helped me get into this state over the years. So I have kind of alluded to her earlier, but one of my favorite workouts is the class by Taryn Toomey. It's really the only workout that I do other than walking. Um, and I do it because I, I'm not someone who like loves working out. I'm not. But I love working out when it helps me work through my trauma. It helps me tap into who I am and tap into this creative state. And the class by Taryn Toomey has been that for me. Um, I started doing it probably, God, 2018. And I remember I walked out of the first class and I felt like I had done like five years of therapy in one afternoon. I walked out feeling so much lighter. And now understanding and having been in therapy and having an amazing therapist who has helped me learn some of these tools to help with my like own anxiety and my own like working through trauma and just also like learning about EMDR um, made me realize that like the reason why I like the class is like all of the movements that she's doing are EMDR. It's like you're stimulating both sides of your brain, which helps you get into a state where you can process trauma from, I think, a, a little bit more of a, I don't know if disassociated state is the right word, but you can kind of work through it in a different way. And um, it's interesting because I now, I do I do still do the class by Taryn Toomey, but my biggest um, almost like necessary thing that I need is walking. I love a long walk. Like, it's interesting because right now I'm on maternity leave um, and I have my children half of the time. So there are days where I have time to do whatever I want. And so it's an interesting thing when you realize that, like, there's, there's very rare moments where someone has this in their life, where they have this kind of space to create and do what they want. And I'm finding that when I have all that time and space, what I want to do is what I've always wanted to do, which is to create. But I wake up first thing in the morning and I go for, I get my coffee at my coffee shop. I go for nearly an eight mile walk through Central Park. I typically have my headphones in. I will sing. I typically don't listen to podcasts when I'm doing that walk. But sometimes if I like turn off my music completely, that's also when I tap into that state. So it's really interesting. And before I got on here, I did some research about that because I've always said that I think that when I'm walking, I'm kind of tapping into that EMDR state. I was actually having a conversation with my mom about this recently. And, and so I looked this up and apparently the founder of EMDR, Francine Shapiro, discovered the process while she was walking. So the rhythmic movement of walking apparently like that in itself, you're stimulating both sides of your brain. And so I find, I think really clearly, especially for this podcast creating, it gives me this space to like fully workshop what I want to talk about and talk about like, so I've talked about songwriting, but like creating in this way, this is a flow state. I, when I record these, typically partially because I'm lazy and I don't really care to do a ton of editing, I don't stop. Like my friend, I was recently talking to one of my friends on the playground and he was like, do you like, how do you approach this? Do you like 
cut them in like 20 minute time frames. And I'm like, honestly, no, I just kind of get on here and go. And I, yeah, I mean, I'll cut out the ums and the buts and I, I use Riverside. I use uh, technology to help me edit this a bit, but in general, I'm just coming on here and going. Now I do have some notes in front of me of like topics that I want to talk about, but to get back to the state, I think that my walks in the morning have helped me to, to be able to realize that like after I do that, I'm in this really clear thinking state that allows me to get on here and just go. And and really like sink into my voice and storytelling and um, uh, again, a flow state. And I fully credit that to this routine of a morning walk. Now I'm already trying to figure out how I am going to incorporate this still when I go back to work. Now granted, I walk to work. I walk everywhere, actually. I live in the city. I think everybody listening to this knows that. But I literally will, I get really car sick, so I don't take cars in general unless I'm going to the airport. And I really have grown to hate the subway. Um, So I, I live in walking distance from where I work. I walk a lot. And so I do kind of already do this. But I think these like Central Park walks in the morning... I really need to figure out a way to like on the mornings that I don't have my kids wake up really early and make this happen so that I can continually be in this flow state because I'm just, I'm just thinking on a clearer level and also the confidence that comes from that. You just really fall into who you are. Um, And I mean, I think part of that goes back to everything I've gone through in the past year. You know, I'm, I've done a lot of therapy and, um, big believer of that. And also talk about creativity when you understand your triggers, your history, your baggage, when you start to, especially when you work with a therapist for quite a while you really start to make these amazing connections between, oh, that's why I'm, that's why I do this. And this is why I do that. So again, the more that you understand that, it feeds into your creative state because you're working through some of these like shames and blockages that stop you from that. And the things where you don't believe in yourself and you are kind of, like I talked about in my last episode, the war on art, you're resistant to your own creation and your own potential. Um, one of my favorite podcasts, everybody, everybody who knows me knows that I am the biggest fan of Aaron and Sarah Foster. I have listened to their podcast the world's first podcast for years. Um, Like literally I've heard every episode, but you guys should definitely go listen to the, the episode where Erin talks about how she wrote nobody want this. And it's, I think it's called everybody wants this because it's a fantastic show. I think everybody's seen it, but she talks about how she like needed to write this script and she really was rejecting doing it. She was avoiding it. Um, And she was using excuses. And she talked about how she was really happy. Like she had finally found her guy. She was scared that like writing would like mess up that mode. And like, my God, I identified with that so much. I've always said I have a hard time writing when I'm happy. I do. I, I mean, most singer songwriters, you, you want to write, you, just things come out more. You have things to process. You have things to say when you're unhappy, when you're heartbroken. So 
you know, I think definitely in my 20s, I was a bit of a like glutton for punishment for that. It was like, do it for the art. I definitely did that. Um, but it was interesting, her talking about how she was almost afraid to mess up that happiness. And I've been there. I have been there. I have found that like often when I'm in relationships, I do not write. Um, (laughs) and I don't invest in myself as much. Uh, so yeah, you should, you guys should definitely check out that episode, but in general, I have resisted that. I do think that, you know, having children, it's interesting because for years before I had my kids, I thought that, well, A, I thought that I would never be a mom. Like I remember sitting at San Ambrose in West Village with my mom in like 2019 and, and just having a very frank conversation with her being like, I need you to love and accept me for who I am in that I am not going to, I I've come to peace with that. I'm probably not going to be a mother. Um, because back then in my head, I had this narrative of like, you can't make your dreams come true as a singer songwriter. You can't do that and be a mom. It was like, once you become a mom, you have to put those things aside. You have much more important things to focus on. And those two things cannot coexist. Um, And I kind of had that rule in my head. And Uh, it's just, God, again, these lies that we tell ourselves, it's such bullshit. It's such bullshit. And it's interesting because my friend Laurent, um, you know, he reached out to me when I was pregnant with Dean and he texted me like this podcast that was about, um, where this woman was talking about how the best mom that she could be to her kids is like not giving up her creative passions and how she wanted to like make a point to, um, you know, not give that up to be an example for them of feeling fulfilled and feeling happy. Um, And at the time when he sent that to me, I remember, I mean, first of all, I was very hormonal. I think I was in the first trimester. And when you're pregnant, you just have this like fear of like, especially, I mean, with your first of like the mind fuck that is the identity change that you are about to go through in becoming a mom. And so I was already in that kind of like, my identity is completely changing at warp speed mode when he sent me this. And I remember being so pissed off and like defensive. And I was like, I've lived a full life. I have played shows like, cause in my mind I was like, I'm getting married. I'm having a baby. I, I, I did all the things that I'm supposed to, that my mommy wanted me to do to be the good girl that I am supposed to be. Not the, you know, pathetic musician who didn't make it, who's still trying. Um, But you know what? That's who I am. And I love who I am now. But back then, I didn't get that. So I thought that I had to put all of my creative pursuits away when I became a mother. And I just, how stupid I was because here's the truth. When I became a mom, I became a million times more efficient with everything in my life, with everything. It's interesting that moms like get a bad rap in the workplace because like HR managers take note of this. You should be hiring recent moms because of the amount of organizational brilliance that they have going on in their mind, I am a million times more effective than I was before I was a mother. 
I can manage and accomplish so many more things in such a different regimented time frame. Um, and I figured out that like the love, I mean, the biggest thing was like opening my heart up to becoming a mother and the love uh, that I have towards my children only helped my art. It only made me a better songwriter. It only made me a better singer. Um, you know, someone recently was like, you sing with a lot more soul now. Well, yeah, I, I've got a lot more soul. My soul has doubled outside of my body. I, I don't just operate within myself anymore. And so that feeds into my creativity. It does. You, you don't have to choose. So if you are like me, like I was years ago, feeling like you have to choose and you have, you, you're not able to have, be creative and have children and uh, they will make you more creative. They will. They, at least in my experience, but also just understanding myself, um, getting older and just knowing my voice. I think, again, the divorce mom energy where I don't really care about the approval from men or I'm just, I'm not chasing that. I am, I am in a state where I am trying to be the most fulfilled, happy, creative mother that I can be to myself or to my children, but also to myself because I am a better mother when I fiercely love, take care of, and protect myself. I am a better creator when I am investing in myself. So I hope that this episode has uh, inspired you guys to put your phones down and go do the dishes and go for a walk and try to tap into your expansive, creative flow. Um, but also try to let go of some of the, the beliefs that you've put for yourself. You know, creativity happens when you get outside of your comfort zone. Um, so yeah, leave space, get bored. Don't try to force it when it's not there. Um, and yeah, when you get into those states where you're tired and you're tapping into that brilliance, like, ah, lean into it, lean into it. But at the end of the day, figure out what works for you. Because what works for me, the weirdo Aquarius, may not work for a regimented Virgo. So figure out that. I definitely am a big believer in astrology. Um, and yeah, keep creating y'all. And thanks for listening as always. Love ya.
Show me your deep friends, try it on for sight.